I'm Allison with the Mission 43 Education Pillar, and we're starting a new discovery series where we sit down with the experts to learn more about what it takes to make it in the career field and the education to get you there. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. I know Shane is a tough show to follow up, but I think you'll be fine. <sighs> Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Shane talked about how in the King Air, there's two seats and you fill one of those. I definitely fill one of those <laughs> on most occasions for a small unit. Um, yeah, it's a crewed aircraft, so crew coordination is important and you, know, you kind of learn how to operate as a team and you get to know each other real well when you sit for four or five hours at a time, six inches apart from each other. <laughs> Is this all day, every day? It's not every day, but it's a lot of days. So tell me a little bit about, about what you do. So I'm uh, like Shane, I'm in the active guard reserve, so I'm active duty in the guard. And I'm the operations officer in the C-12 unit for the Idaho Army National Guard. And we're responsible for employing that. The, it's a Super King Air 200 that we have. It's a C-12V, that's a Victor model. And we fly that for, the Department of Defense has a command called JOSAC and they kind of, all the missions funnel through JOSAC and then they farm those out to the different debts. Most, every state has a fixed wing detachment. So we get our missions from them. We're not in charge of who we fly or what we fly. Uh, we get assigned the mission and then we go. So it's something different every day. So it's it's actually, really enjoyable. Um, tell me a little bit about the aircraft you have flown. Uh, I've been super fortunate. I'm one of the, I'm a guy that's, my ratings have come exclusively from the military. So I am really lucky in the fact that I have not paid for one single rating yet. And I've also gotten to fly quite a few different airframes. I've got more experience in some than others. I started out in the Apache. Uh, so I flew the Alpha and Delta model Apache variants. Started out in a little tiny uh, Jet Ranger, a Bell 206. Um, once I switched over to the fixed wing side, I've flown obviously the King Air, the C-12 is what the Army calls it. But on the on the road to the King Air, I've, I've flown, you know, a Cessna 182, a Zlin uh, for some upset recovery stuff, an extra 300, uh, which is amazing. Uh, I've been told by my instructors that it G's out the same as a two-seater F-18, it was amazing. <laughs> and then I've flown a banana, uh, not a bonanza, a Baron. Yep. Uh, and then the, obviously the King Air. The, the majority of my experience is in either an Apache or the C-12. That's where the majority of my flight time is. What's been your most favorite to fly? You know, I love them all different. I, I absolutely loved the Apache. It fit in kind of with where I came from in, the, in my enlisted time. But I was a lot younger, um, and I love, surprisingly, coming from guns, I love the King Air. I love the challenge. There's something new. Every flight is different. Um, you're, you know, you can plan for 10 hours, but as soon as you get your clearance, your plan goes out the window. So I really, really enjoy the King Air, and it's been valuable experience for, you know, when I start looking at transitioning out of the military. So which did you find easier to learn to fly, helicopter or airplane? That's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> so I'll give you a loaded answer. At the time, I was brand new. I had zero aviation experience when I learned how to fly a helicopter. So for me, that was more challenging. By the time I switched over to fixed wing, you know, I, I think I was over the 3,000 hour mark. So it was a lot easier for me just because I had, you know, some of the airmanship and you know, I was wired into aviation at that point. I think actually the the mechan the, the physical inputs of flying an airplane are maybe easier, but there's a lot to learn on in both. Because I'm really interested in how, so you were enlisted. I was. And what made the change over into now I'm flying helicopters? <sighs> you know, I was enlisted, I was in, um, light units so I did lots of walking and it sounds bad I wasn't like 
you know, the little boy looking at airplanes, I'm going to do that someday. <laughs> I was tired of walking. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know, 9-11 happened and everybody, you know, feels the call to service. And I had gotten out right before 9-11. And when I went back in, I was like thinking that maybe I didn't want to walk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're tired of walking, learn to fly. <laughs> and I, uh, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, her brother flew. And that, that was actually kind of the, the end, what sparked the interest. He flew Apaches actually in the Idaho Guard. And that, you know, once after talking to him, that's kind of what led me down that path of, well, maybe I could do that instead of walk. <laughs> Spencer, I didn't know that about you. So you learn something new every day. You're a first officer for American Airlines. I am. So what can you tell me about that process of becoming a commercial airline pilot? Oh, it's a long process. I, I am super fortunate to have, you know, it, it was the perfect scenario for me. I got picked up by, uh, you know, a legacy carrier right out of the military. Um, it, and it's not an easy thing to do. And a lot of it may be a situation, a little bit of luck. Uh, and having the ratings, but the road, it, I would say once you start targeting, you know, airlines, how many hours you have to some degree counts because they have minimums. Uh, and then the quality of experience that you get leading up to that is really what helped, what helped me get the job. So, and I think that you might be talking yourself down a little bit, but that might be speaking to your experience. How many flight hours do you have? Uh, I don't have the exact number. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, ha I don't have a lot compared to some people, but I think I'm just over 5,000, maybe 51, 5,200, somewhere in there. And that I've, you know, like I said, I, I've gotten everything through the military. So I'm really fortunate that with the exception of some of the, the smaller piston aircraft when I was in training, all of my time has been in a turbine aircraft, which counts, um, you know, that, that counts for something when you start applying for jobs outside of the military. Well, how long have you been flying in the military? I've been flying since 2002 in the military. So what are you going to do when you grow up? When I grow up, I'm going to be a first officer at American Airlines. <laughs> I somehow landed my dream job and that's what's next for me. When did you start looking at commercial airlines? I did not actually start looking at that as a career path, um, you know, because the military is my career path until I, I would say a year or two in um, to me joining the fixed wing detachment in the military is when I started, you know, the light bulb went off. I could, you know, I could do this when I get out of the military. I enjoy this. Uh, I'm good at it. You know, this is something that I could see myself doing once I make that transition. So I'll ask you the same thing that I asked Shane um, because your stories are so different. If you have one piece of advice to give to someone starting out this process, what would that be? Well, I wouldn't say that it's just one piece of advice, but maybe a couple snippets of advice rolled up in one. Uh, it's a long game. If you plan on flying for a career, the barriers to entry in aviation are, are pretty high because of the cost. Although some of those, that barrier is starting to get broken down because of the shortage of pilots. Um, companies are getting really creative with finding pathways to, to enable, you know, to, to fill that pilot pool. Uh, health is another one. You know, you gotta be, you have to maintain for, for a lot of these jobs, you have to maintain a physical. Uh, so, you know, you, if you're staking your career, your livelihood on flying, you have to stay healthy. And then I think Shane said it earlier, the work. Like it takes a lot of work to, to get there. Uh, most of the jobs starting out are lower pay, but the ceiling is pretty high. So if you can get through the first couple of years uh, and put the work in to actually get to that first job, the rewards, you know, flying for a job is not a bad thing. Um, and the, you know, like I said, the, the potential is pretty, it's unlimited on the potential. So put the work in. It's one of those jobs that um, you're always learning in. You never peak in aviation. It's not, you know, they always say it's not inherently dangerous, but uh, mistakes are unforgiving. So you really have to kind of sign on to that adage of lifelong learning. Like if you're going to be in aviation, you're going to, you're signing up to be forever 
educating yourself. You're in college forever, basically. Do you have to renew your certifications or your ratings? The instructor ratings you have to renew. Uh, airline transport pilot, once you get that, you've got it. But the instructor ratings you have to renew. So we talked, to, or you talked about, I'm sorry, the barriers to entry, and I'm really interested in that, and I don't know if you can give me this answer, but um, so cost is one of those. Is that the cost to get into um, education, to get, it, to get to the point where you qualify for these jobs? Yeah, I mean, it's, the cost of education is expensive, fuel is expensive, uh, aircraft time is expensive, um, and then once you get the ratings, that's really just one of the minimum requirements after that. You know, most companies have an hour requirement, a minimum, and then to be competitive, you know, it's something above that. And airplane time is not cheap. So, but, but like I said, companies are getting creative because there is definitely a shortage of pilots. So there's a pilot shortage, um, but what would be the perfect, I mean, besides yourself, what's the perfect pilot candidate with um, the, <laughs> besides <laughs> like yourself, that. you're obviously the perfect pilot candidate. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody's got to be perfect. Um, it, if you're looking at, you know, aviation as a career, you know, you're going to have speed bumps on the way. You're going to, you know, there's going to be the occasional failed check ride, but they're good jobs and it's super competitive. So you have to enter, you know, you have to start that journey with that in mind that, hey, I need to put the work in. Every check ride's a potential, you know, speed bump. You know, and I don't want to carry that on my, you know, with me throughout my career. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, you can make mistakes, you can fail check rides and still be successful, but, you know, the fewer the better. So, uh, you really need to, you need to plan for the long term. This, you know, we say fly by the seat of your pants, but that's not something that you can really do if, you're, if your end state is to fly, you know, for a big airline or some, or a corporate job. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to hire a problem. So. Keep that in mind as you're, you know, starting the journey. I think something we haven't really touched on at all that you mentioned, and thank you, is the health aspect. So what are some of the health and physical requirements? Um, they're, not, they're not extreme, but you've got to stay healthy. Uh, you've got to stay active. Um, you know, there's lots of different things that can disqualify you from a class one physical or, or class two. That's something that you kind of have to do your research on, okay. um, and just know that that you know there you could have one of those days where one of those weird health things rears its head, and all of a sudden you're grounded. Oh. So it, it's definitely something to consider when you start looking at flying for a living. Well, definitely put a little bit of research in a wrap up because that sounds really interesting. Is there any age requirements on? Because this one of those careers that's kind of like the military that says you're done here, you can start here. Part 121 or, you know, the airline, you know, the, the air carriers, they, there is a max, you know, 65, you can't fly past that currently. Mm -hmm. um, and then it varies beyond that. You know, you can fly past 65, but it all depends on what job, you know, that you get or if you're flying for pay or, you know, you can fly general aviation for a long time just for, for yourself, for the sheer enjoyment of it. Well, Spencer, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting about aviation today. I really appreciate your time. Oh, thanks for having me. I love talking airplanes and aviation.